Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity and privilege that we have to open your holy words, to seek your face. As 2 Chronicles chapter 7 says, even to turn from our wicked ways, that we will hear from heaven, that you would, that you would hear from heaven, that you would forgive our sins, that you will heal our land. Today we pray, O oh Father, for your blessing to be with us as we are seeking for your grace and mercy. Please forgive us of our sins. I'll pour your Holy Spirit. Use this lump of clay that only your words, your truth, your spirit will speak through me today, O oh God. And may you attend these words with power, with wisdom, with understanding, and with application to fit us for your second coming. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. Bless those listening online as well as locally. And may we receive a rich, rich, rich blessing from the throne of grace we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Our topic this afternoon is entitled, Our Divine Assignment. The three angels' messages get to work. Our divine assignment, the three angels' messages get to work. Let's go in our Bible to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Our divine assignment, the three angels' messages get to work. In the Bible, God has always gave his people assignments to do. Things that they had to do in order to be a blessing to the world. In order to give the message to the world, every person from Genesis to Revelation had a divine assignment from God. And I don't, I don't know about you, but have you ever been in school and there was a deadline where you had to complete an assignment, a work assignment? Or have you ever been in school and there was a test coming and you knew that in order for you to pass that test, you had to stay up late, you had to study a lot, you had to rob yourself of sleep. Some of us have done that, right? You even have to rob yourself of association with friends because you know that the assignment is so important. And if you want to pass, you have to sacrifice in order for that assignment to be carried out. And I want us to know, friends, that in God's work, it requires sacrifice. It requires dedication. It requires commitment. It requires us to sacrifice even time so that we can complete this divine assignment for us in these last days. And God wants us, by His grace, to complete this divine assignment that He's given to us as a people right before the coming of the Lord. We're going to talk about what is our divine assignment and why is the three angels' messages that assignment and why God wants us to get the work. And friends, listen, every person in the Bible had a divine assignment. Adam and Eve, God called them and put them in the garden. And did not they have a divine assignment? The Bible says that they were supposed to keep the garden and, and watch over it. So that was their divine assignment. Then we have Noah, the same book of Genesis, where the Bible says that he was supposed to preach to the world and warn them that a flood was coming and prepare an ark. So in Noah's day, that was his divine assignment. That was a message to prepare them for what was coming. And he had to fulfill that divine assignment. Even Abraham had a divine assignment. The Bible says that God called Abraham to be a father of many nations. And that through the world, through him, many nations would be blessed. So Abraham had a divine assignment. Remember jo Joseph in the Bible? Joseph, when he was sent to Egypt, he was sent by God's divine power and providence in a divine assignment to tell Pharaoh what would happen to Egypt. And through his work... He was able to fulfill God's calling on his life as he fulfilled God's divine assignment. Now, friends, we're not living in the time of Genesis anymore. Are you with me so far? In the time of Exodus, Noah, I'm sorry, Moses had a divine assignment. God said to Moses and Aaron, I want you to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. I want you to bring them to the wilderness, bring them to the promised land. And by God's grace, Moses and Aaron were able to fulfill that divine assignment. God even got the two individual involved and said, listen, I want them to build a sanctuary. And everyone was contributing to the work. Everyone was giving to the work. Everyone was putting their hands on in the work. And everyone was fulfilling that divine assignment. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. In the book of Leviticus, the Bible talks about the priests in the sanctuary. Right? They had an assignment in the temple of God. They had to offer up incense 
to God, and they were praying for, on behalf of those on the outside, Israel. So there was a divine assignment for Israel at that time, and the divine assignment for the priests at that time. Are you with me? Say amen. Oh, friends, in the book of Deuteronomy, I mean, we can go over and over again. God has always given divine assignments. When they were going to spy out, they, they wanted to go to the promised land. He sent out spies to spy out the promised land. Are you with me so far? That's in the book of Numbers. But over and over again, God has given his people a divine assignment. Esther was on a divine assignment for God, correct? When the Jews were going to be killed, she stood up and said, Lord, she stood up before the king and she said, if I perish, I perish. But I got a message for you. So she was on a divine assignment. Are you with me so far? Say amen. Even people that didn't, <laughs> that didn't take it seriously were on divine assignment. Samson had a divine assignment, correct? Right, he was supposed to lead the people and, and also protect them from the Philistines. And then we have, uh, what's his name? Jonah. Was Jonah on divine assignment from God? To go preach to Nineveh, right? To warn them of the destruction that was coming. So Noah was sent on divine assignment. So friends, listen. In these last days, what is our divine assignment? What is God calling this generation to do? Because every generation there was a divine assignment, a divine message, a divine work that God called them all to do. Even John the Baptist, right before Christ came, he had the divine assignment. Here's the Lamb of God. He preached and pointed them to Jesus. That was his divine assignment. Jesus gathered disciples. That was their divine assignment. So what is our divine assignment in these last days? In Revelation chapter 14, are you with me, friends? Now, question, is Revelation the beginning, the middle, or the end of the Bible? Talk to me. It's the end of the Bible. That shows us we're living at what time? The end of time. We're living in the last days. So our divine assignment, every Christian, their assignment should be in the book of Revelation. It's the last book of the Bible. We're living in the last days. And the end time message is in Revelation chapter 14. Are you with me so far? So our divine assignment is in this book. And the question, why is our divine assignment in Revelation chapter 14? Why is it in this book? Listen now. Because Revelation 14 is the message that goes to all the world right before Christ comes. Are you with me so far? Say amen. It is the very last message. It is the last message that goes to the whole world right before Christ comes. Are you with me? Say amen. In Revelation chapter 15 and 16 are the seven last plagues. Are you with me so far? The seven last plagues are poured out on people that reject the message of Revelation chapter 14. If that's your say amen. And Revelation chapter 17 and 18 is the fall of Babylon and the call to come out of Babylon. And those who are falling in Babylon, they reject the message of Revelation 14. Those who are called out of Babylon are those who accept the message of Revelation chapter 14. Are you with me? Say amen. Revelation 19 is the coming of the Lord. We see Jesus coming. He's coming for people that accepted the messages of Revelation 14. Are you with me? Say amen. In Revelation 20, we see the righteous are in heaven. The wicked are dead, but then they will rise a thousand years later. The righteous are in heaven because of the message of Revelation 14. Are you with me? The wicked rise in the second resurrection because they reject the message of Revelation 14. In Revelation 20 and 21, we see the new heaven and new earth God created for the people that accepted the message of Revelation 14. Is that clear? Say amen. amen. So the very last message that goes to all the world and brings the coming of the Lord that shows us our divine assignment is in Revelation 14, friends. Are you with me? Now, friends, notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. The Bible speaks of three angels' messages that go to all the world. Now, every person needs to hear this message. Every person needs to understand this message. Every person needs to read and understand and study and apply this message to their lives to prepare for the coming of the Lord. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. So we see one angel. That's Revelation 14, 6. Now look with me in verse 8. The Bible says... And there followed another angel. So there's a second angel. Revelation 14, 8. Now we see a third angel. One last angel. In Revelation chapter 14, 9. And the third angel followed them saying. So we see first, second, and third angels. Three angels. These are the last messages that go to the world right before the coming of the Lord. And how do we know? In verse 14, the Bible says that after these messages are brought out to the world, that brings... The second coming of Christ in verse 14. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, 
And upon the white cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. That's Christ. Having on his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle. So Christ is coming back to the earth. In Revelation 14, 14, so the three angels' messages are the very last messages that goes to the whole world right before the coming of the Lord. Are you going to say amen? And verse 15 now says that Jesus is going to gather all those who have received these three angels' messages in Revelation 14. Revelation 14, 15. The angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. That's Christ. Thrust in thy sickle and reap. Gather. For the time has come for thee to reap or gather. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So people will be ready, right, for the coming of the Lord because of the first, the second, and the three angels' messages. Do you see that? Say amen. So this is our divine assignment for these last days. So listen, friends. If we are going to churches or Bible studies or Christian gatherings, or gatherings that people say they love God, but they're not studying the three angels' message. They're not reading the three angels' message. They don't understand the three angels' message. They need to realize that this is the divine assignment for these last days. Are you going to say amen? And the reason why many Christians are not preaching these three angels' messages is because God gave this message to a certain group of people. In Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, Here is the what? The patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? Keep the commandments of God and have what? The faith of Jesus. So not everybody has this message. Only those who keep the commandments of God and have what? The faith of Jesus Christ. So this message is a worldwide message that everyone needs to hear, but not everybody has it. Therefore, those who have it need to do what? Get to work. Those who have it need to get to work. And I believe with all my heart the reason why the devil is keeping us in a state of inactivity, not working for God, not moving forward and declaring the message, is because he understands the power in this message. He understands the power in this book that you have in your hand. He understands the power of this last day message. Therefore, he's working on us. Temptations, trials, obstacles, difficulties, bringing all kinds of things our way to keep us distracted. Distracted. To keep us bemoaning ourselves. To keep us thinking that, oh, God cannot use me. Listen, we need to come up that mentality. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. There's a work to be done. It's not all about us. We're here to accomplish our divine assignment. We're here to preach the three angels' message and prepare people for the coming of the Lord. And we are going to see in this message that this is the message that God wants the whole world to hear. In Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, And... What? Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel, are you with me? Shall be preached in what? All the world. For a witness unto all nations and what? Then shall the then shall the end come. So the gospel that brings the end, we're in Revelation chapter 14, is the everlasting gospel. If that's going to say amen. amen. Now before we delve into this, I want to show you two things. Alright? Go with me. Well, in Revelation 14, we'll come back here. Go with me to Dan. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24. Where we're going to, friends? Matthew 24, let's go there. Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24, friends. Did you know that Jesus was talking to the disciples? And he told them the end of time. He told them signs that would take place in the last days. We see these signs very clearly. The Bible says that there would be famine in the land. Pestilences, which is disease. We know what happened with the coronavirus. Many disease, right? We see many of the, these signs taking place. Wars and rumors of wars. We know what happened with Israel and Palestine. Are you with me so far? All these signs are fulfilling to a T. And Jesus not only gave the signs, but he even told us what book we are to study in order to get ready for his coming. What message we need to study and preach for his coming in Matthew 24. You still with me, friends? Verse number 15, the Bible says, Matthew 24, 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, when you see these things happen, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So who did Jesus call out? Talk to me. Daniel the prophet. He said, stand in the holy place, and whosoever read it, let him what? Understand. So Jesus says, when you see these things happening, it's time to open the book of what? Of Daniel. Are you with me? Say amen. Daniel is one of the books that show us the end time events of Bible prophecy. It shows us Christ's coming. It shows us that we don't have much time. And it shows us that we're living in a judgment hour. It shows us that we need to preach the message of the judgment. Are you with me so far? Say amen. 
All right? Let me give you another verse. Let's give you another Bible verse. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. So Jesus says when you see these end time events, study Daniel. And in Revelation chapter 1, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ, Jesus also says, study Revelation. All right? Revelation chapter 1. Are you with me so far? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave unto me, unto him, sorry, to show unto his servants the things which must certainly come to pass. It says, he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So this is a revelation of Christ. And in verse 3 it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So it says, Blessed are, are those who are reading the words of Revelation, who are understanding the prophecies in Revelation, right? Who are keeping the prophecies of Revelation because it's time to read it. Do you see that, friends? Say amen. So Jesus said in Matthew 24, read Daniel. And in Revelation 1, he says, read what? Revelation. Do you see that? So that's why we're seeing that this last message has to come from two books. What books? Daniel and Revelation. The last two books every Christian should be studying and reading are Daniel and Revelation. If that's good, say amen. So in Revelation 14, let's go there now. Revelation chapter 14, friends. What I want to do is I want to encourage us to get to work. But you know what, friends? How can we get to work if we don't know the message? Are you with me? <laughs> How can we preach the message if we don't know the message? How can we share the message if we have not experienced the message? Is that clear? Say amen. So what I want to do in this message, friends, I want to break down the three angels' messages in such a simple way that all of us will get an understanding of what it is and what it's saying to us, and then we can now share it with the world. If that's good, say Amen. amen. We're in Revelation chapter 14. And I want to say this before I even begin. Jesus, before he started this earthly ministry in Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says he was fasting and praying how many days? Talk to me. 40 days. That's it. 40 days. What happened as he fasted and prayed? Wasn't the Holy Spirit poured upon him? All right. Think about this now. The disciples, before they went to work, Acts chapter 1, where were they? They were in the upper room. They were also what? Praying, fasting, searching their hearts. Are you with me so far? Did the Holy Spirit fall upon them? How many days were they in the upper room? Talk to me. It was like 50 days. Are you with me so far? Penty calls, right? 50 days. Are you with me? Now think with me, friends. If it took them time to grasp the message, study the message, apply the message, receive the message, and be consecrated to have the message, it may take us time also to get a grasp of the message. Are you with me so far? But in that time, God is still building you. God is still allowing your mind to understand it, that we may now give it to others. Amen? Amen. All right. Revelation chapter 14. Now write this down if you have a pen and paper, friends. So we're going to look at seven things, and then we're going to bring this to a close. Seven things. All right? I'm going to start from number seven. All right? So if you have a paper, write down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seven point is very important. The seven point is what closes this whole prophecy. It's in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. Are you with me so far? Say amen. All right, verse number 14. The Bible says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and one, it says, Upon the cloud, one sat like unto a son of man, that's Christ, having on his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle. So the, it says, This point now, this point right here, is the second coming of Christ. Are you with me so far? Say amen. So seven is the second coming of Christ. Now how many of us want to be ready for Christ's second coming? All right. So everything we're going to read prior to point seven will prepare us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. If that's clear, say amen. All right. Now, let's go to point one. And we're going to make our way down to point seven. Point number one. I want you to write down point number one, the everlasting gospel. What are you writing down? The everlasting gospel. Point number two, I want you to write down fear God. What are you writing down? Fear God. Point number three, I want you to write down give glory to God. What are we writing down? Give glory to God. Point number four, I want you to write down the judgment hour. What are we writing down? The judgment hour, point four. Point five, we're writing down worship him. What are we writing down? Worship him. Point six, I want you to write down God's people. What are we writing down? God's people or God's remnant people. Are you with me so far? And then point seven is the second coming of Christ. Are you ready to study, friends? 
All right. Point one. Point one is powerful. Point one is so important. Point one to me, I believe, is one of the most important points because without point one, you can throw the whole message away. Are right, you with me so far? The everlasting gospel. Verse six, the Bible says, And I saw another angel, first angel's message, fly in the midst of heaven, having what? Talk to me. The everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. So let's stop there. So in the first angel's message, it's a message about the everlasting gospel. Are you with me? So say amen. The everlasting gospel is the love of God that was shown in the life of Christ. When God gave his son to die for us, when God gave his son to take on all of our sins, when God gave his son to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah, that he would be a lamb that was sent to the slaughter, when God sent his son that he was going to take on our sins and bear the wrath of God and be disconnected from the Father through Christ now, through receiving the gospel, we all receive salvation and power and forgiveness. Are you with me? Say amen. It's the gospel of God's grace. Jesus decided to leave heaven. He decided to leave his father's throne. He decided to leave everything that was in heaven to take on human nature to be a man and then to die a death that all of us should have died. All of the sins that we're guilty of, all the things that we have done, Christ decided to take your place. And when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as you receive the gospel, as you receive Christ, now you, he sees his life covering you and not your own life of sin. Are you with me? Say amen. See, one of the reasons why the devil is stopping us from even doing the work of God is because we don't understand the gospel. Some of us feel guilty of the, over the past, right? Some of us have doubts whether we, where we stand with God. Some of us don't know if God even loves us. Listen, this is the everlasting gospel. This was a plan that came into play before we were even born. Before we were even a thought in our parents' mind. Before you were even conceived. Before that sperm hit that egg. God had a plan. He saw you in it. He saw 2023. He says, I need these people to come because I want them to fulfill the divine assignment. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. God loves you. Everlasting gospel. Can you imagine how God must be offended? I mean, think with me. I know I know sin is powerful. I know guilt is powerful. I know mistakes, yes. I know that yes, I know shortcomings, yes, and all that. But listen, can you um, imagine God in heaven looking down in 2023, seeing all of us here today, and he says, There's a last message I need to go to the world, they need to fulfill the divine assignment, and then you make a mistake. And now you think that God wants to throw you away. When he already had a plan. When he already saw where you would be today. Where he saw the life that you would live. Where he saw that uh, I have the solution. The everlasting gospel. The blood of Jesus Christ. I'm working through my Holy Spirit. Through the holy angels. Through the word. To try to get you out of that mentality. So that you now focus on the world. And preach the gospel to the world. But our own mistakes and failures bombard us to stop moving for God. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. See, we all need to know what the gospel means to us. I believe this is the most important step because once we understand the gospel, you understand God loves you. There's nothing you can do to add or take away his love. Are you with me so far? Amen. Even if you are lost and in sin, God still loves you. Yes. That's the gospel. And once you receive him, he can change you. Once you receive him, and you have to believe on him. And when the devil tells you that you're too far or, 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 or you're too simple, you have to believe the words of God. Are you with me? Say amen. Oh, this is the beauty of the gospel. We need to receive the gospel. That Jesus loves each and every one of us and his love is undying. When we read stories in the Bible about the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost son. The lost coin was in the house. All of us are valuable. You can be lost in the church. Are you with me so far? God still loves you. God wants us to be saved. You can be lost in the world. God is still seeking after the lost sheep, the lost son that left the church. And now, trying to come back, God still loves you. He says, listen, I want to restore you. Are you with me so far? Say amen. amen. And unless we understand what the gospel is in our lives, we can never share that with other people. Are you with me so far? Say amen. amen. So the everlasting gospel, I believe, is one of the most important parts of this message. See, Revelation 14 is it, going to talk about beasts and understanding what's going to happen in the future and current events. People love talking about all that stuff. But what about the gospel? What about Christ dying for us? What about Gethsemane? What about the cross? What about the pain he endured? What about his sacrifice for us? Are you with me? Say amen. Yes. See, we cannot take Jesus out of the three angels' message and preach the message. Amen. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. So listen, if you're focused on the life of Christ, if you're studying about Jesus, you are focused on the three angels' message. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. 
But I want you to know that's not all of the message. If that's clear, say amen. All right, point number two. So we need that everlasting gospel. Point two now says, fear God. Verse seven, Revelation 14, seven. Saying with a loud voice to what? Fear God. Now friends, what does it mean to fear God? We're, we're, we're breaking down the three angels' messages in seven simple points. Because this is the last message that goes to all the world. So we need to understand what the gospel means to us. We also need to know what it means to do what? You stay with me? What it means to fear God. Are you with me? Say amen. Yes. All right. A little quiet this morning. It's okay. <laughs> so what does it mean to fear God? Let's go in our Bible to the book of Proverbs, chapter 9 and verse 10. Proverbs, chapter 9 and verse 10. In the Bible, fearing God... There's many applications and understandings to fearing God. We'll go through some of the verses today. In Proverbs chapter 9, fearing God means that you're willing to be taught His ways. Fearing God means that you're willing to get wisdom from God to know what He wants for your life. Fearing God means you're willing to receive wisdom from God and whatever He says in your life, you're willing to see it and apply it to your life. That is what it means to fear God. Right? We say amen. So after you receive the gospel, after you believe in Jesus, yes, he died for your sins, you love him. Now he's saying to all of us, we all need to get wisdom from God, from the Holy Spirit, from his word, from the prophets. We need lots and lots of wisdom and then apply what we're learning to our lives. If that's going to say amen. amen. See, friends, the Bible says in, Reve in Proverbs chapter 9, and verse 10, let's read. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. So the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God wants to teach us His Word. He wants you to understand His Word. He has given to us the Holy Spirit to understand His Word. We can open the Bibles and know what it's saying for ourselves. Are you with me so far? We have the greatest teacher, which is the Holy Spirit. And we can go from verse to verse, and the Holy Spirit will tell us what its meaning is. If that's your say, amen. You know, I, I, I'm very fearful of churches that when they get up on a pulpit, they don't even have their Bibles open. I'm very fearful when I see the congregation not opening their Bibles. I'm very fearful of people that don't open the Bible and seek the wisdom from God. How can you trust what the minister is saying if there's no wisdom coming from God? If that's Chris, say amen. There are many churches that say, I believe the gospel. Praise God. But do you fear God? Where is the Bibles? Where is the wisdom? Where is the scriptures? Where is the truth? I'm not being convicted. What's happening here? Are you going to say amen? We all need wisdom from God. And this wisdom could be in your home. To order your home the way God wants it to be ordered. This wisdom could be for your children. To raise your children in the ways of God. This wisdom could be for yourself. How can I be a better husband, a better wife, a better brother, a better sister, a better evangelist for Jesus? Are you with me? Say amen. amen. In order for that to happen, we must have wisdom from God. Let's go to Psalms 25. Where we're going to, friends? All right. Psalm 25, verse 12. Going in our Bible to Psalm 25, verse 12. It's emphasizing the point that fearing God means that you're willing to apply His Word to your life. Wisdom. Fear the Lord. We need wisdom. We need truth. We need Bibles in order to fear God. Is that clear? Say amen. amen. When people say, oh, look at that person. He's a God-fearing person. Look at that woman. He's a, she's a God-fearing woman. Look at that home. A God-fearing home. It simply means they receive wisdom from God and now they're applying His principles to their life. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Alright, Psalm 25. The Bible says in verse 12, Psalm 25 and verse 12, it says, What man is he that feareth the Lord? So the question is, who is the person that fears God? Here's the answer now. Him shall he teach, what? In the way that he shall choose. So the Bible says, someone that fears God is someone that God is teaching his ways. If that's going to say amen. And notice it says, his way. There's a way that God has for us. There's a lifestyle that God has for us. There's a way of living God has for us. And unless we're studying what His way is, the way that He has chosen, we won't know. And as a result, we won't fear God. Are you with me so far? Yes. So listen, let me pause right here and say this. You cannot trust God's way to a pastor or a teacher. You need to know for yourself. Are you with me? Yes. And when a pastor or teacher preaches, you need to go back to the Bible and make sure it's God's way. If that's going to say Amen. amen. You cannot trust God's way for your life in any matter, in any matter. Even if it's a close friend, someone you trust, someone you love, someone you appreciate, you cannot trust their way. You have to trust what? God's way. Are you going to say amen? Yes, amen? And sometimes God's wisdom, He gives to us, we don't like it. We want to make excuses as to why we want to have our way. But if God is a God of wisdom, 
We should submit to his wisdom and surrender our foolish thinking. Because all, the opposite of God's wisdom is our foolishness. Is that clear? Say amen. Sometimes we have these ways that are not of God. We must be willing to be taught God's ways. Are you so far? Say amen. So every church, if they're going to obey this commandment, the fear of God, they have all oh, must be studying the word of God. Yes. Turning in their scriptures, understanding what God is saying to us. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. And by the way, God has often declared his way from Genesis to Revelation through prophets. I want to emphasize that. He declared his way through the prophets. Yes. All right? Now, once we're being taught of God, notice what the Bible says. We're going to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5.21. This is all under the subject of fear God, which is point number two. God wants us to now, once we learn his ways, to surrender. To surrender. Surrender to what we're reading, what we're learning, what we're hearing. Surrender to him. That's how we up have the fear of God. When the Lord shows me what I need to do from the word of God, and it conflicts with what he wants, I got to be willing to surrender. Once I surrender, that shows that I fear God. If that's clear, say Amen. All right, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21. Do we have it, friends? Let's read together. It says, submitting yourselves one to another in what? In the fear of God. So the Bible says, we show that we have the fear of God once we submit ourselves. If that's clear, say amen. Surrender ourselves to God. So not only do you need to read what the Bible says, what the prophets say, what God is saying, but you show you fear God once you what? Surrender. 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 Friends, the more we go through these steps, you'll realize that even within God's remnant, professed remnant church, there's a lack of the first angel's message and experience in there. Are you going to say amen? Lack of surrendering. Lack of studying God's word and his will for your life. Lack of yielding self to God. There's a lack. And God needs a people that will have the fear of God. Are you going to say amen? amen. All right. All right. And with this surrendering yourself to God, I'll say this one last point about fearing God. This was a Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 to 8. Proverbs 3, verse 7 to 8. When you surrender to God because of the things that you're learning, that means you are actually turning from the lifestyle of sin that you once knew before. Things that you did not think was sin, when God gives you wisdom, when God gives you light, when God gives you truth, now he says that's a sin. Or you didn't know before? He says it's a sin. So now as we see it, he wants us to surrender ourselves to the light he's revealing and then turn ourselves from our own way. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Proverbs chapter 3, the Bible says in verse number 7 and 8. All right, the Bible says, as a matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 3, let's look at verse uh, 6 and 7, rather. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall what? Direct thy paths. And it says... Be not wise in your own eyes. Don't think your ways are the best. Be not wise in thine own eyes, but what? Fear the Lord and do what? Depart from evil. So once we see God's word, God's ways for our life, we must be willing to depart from a lifestyle that is wrong and goes against the wisdom and the knowledge of God. If that's clear, say amen, friends. All right. Now we're experiencing the message. Now that we understand the message, we can experience it. Are you with me? Say amen. We fall in love with the gospel, with Jesus, with God, with, the, with what he's doing in our lives. And then he leads us to fear him, to study our Bibles and to get a knowledge of truth. And then apply that truth to our life. And also in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14, the Bible says, Let us hear the conclusion of what? The whole matter. Fear what? Fear God and what? Keep his what? Commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So part of fearing God is learning his ways. Seeing his truth, surrendering to him, and then, after you surrender to him, say, Lord, help me to live a lifestyle that reflects your commandments. Amen? amen. Are you with me? Say amen. Yes. amen. A lot of churches believe that once you receive the gospel and you receive Jesus Christ, that the law is canceled. That you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore because Jesus died, and he, when he died, he, he nailed the law to the cross. Listen, we... Part of the message, you see the gospel, you see Jesus, you fall in love with Jesus. He's the only one that saves us. But God is trying now to move us to fear him, which is walk in his ways, understand his truth, apply his truth, surrender our lives, and by his grace, ask him for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit so he can help us to keep the commandments. If that's your say amen. All right, let's go back to Revelation 14. What's our third point now? It's on your paper, it should be. What is it? Give God glory. All right. 
So Revelation 14, verse 6, the Bible says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, that was number one, to preach on the earth, on the earth to every nation, king, your tongue, and people. And I just want to say this, the gospel is a personal for everybody. God wants an individual relationship with all of us. Amen? And then it says in verse 7, Sing with a loud voice, fear God, that's number two. And number three, and give him what? Give him glory. Now, let's look at a couple scriptures on what it means to give God glory. Let's go in our Bible to the book of Joshua chapter 7. Where we're going to, friends? Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. One of the ways that we give God glory is by confessing our sins. One of the ways that we give God glory is saying, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. And we're willing to surrender our sin to him and ask him for repentance and pardon and grace. That's one of the ways that we give God glory. In the story of Achan, Achan had took something that did not belong to him. He stole something. It was a Babylonian garment that he took. And he hid it in his camp. And Joshua said to Achan, I want you to give God glory and confess your sins to me. Are you with me so far? So when we confess our sin to God, we give him glory. So listen, when we start studying our Bibles and learning and, and seeing the truth, there's going to be things that we're going to see that we're wrong on. And God's going to say, okay, I need you to confess this to me. Are you with me so far? In Joshua 7, verse 19, the Bible says this. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, what? Glory to the Lord of God, the Lord God of Israel, and make what? Confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done, and hide it not from me. Do you see that, friends? So, one of the ways we give God glory is by confessing our sins. Are you to say amen? amen? Another way we, that we give God glory, let's go in our Bible to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I believe this is one of the most important ways, to be honest. We're going to Colossians chapter 1. And notice what the Bible says in verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. We also give God glory when we ask Jesus to live in our hearts every day. We, when we invite Christ into our lives every day, when we ask Him to live out His life within us, that is how we give God glory. Are you with me? Say amen. Are you with me? Yes. All right. Colossians 1, verse 27. Are you there, friends? The Bible says, it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles. What's his glory? Which is Christ in you, finish it, the hope of glory. So when we say, Lord, I give you my life, come into my heart, you're giving God glory. Amen? God gets glory when we invite him into our lives so that we live differently. Amen? So this message is to receive the gospel have the fear of God, and now reflect Jesus. Have Jesus in our hearts so that we can give Him glory. Amen? There's another way we give God glory. So this is the inside. Christ coming on the inside. Another way that we give God glory, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Friends, you still with me? Say amen. amen. Alright. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Another way that we give God glory is by how we treat our bodies. The health message is one of the ways that we give God glory. We have health talks and, and to remind us to drink water, exercise, get some sleep, right? We have messages to encourage us to live healthy lives because according to the Bible, that is how we give God glory. So if there are bodies of believers out there or, or churches that do not have an emphasis on health, how can we give God glory? Are you with me saying amen? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says in verse number 19, are we there? Let's read together, friends. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? So the Holy Spirit is in us. Christ is in us, giving Him glory. And then it says in verse number 21, I'm sorry, verse number 20, For you are bought with a price. What price was that? Talk to me. Calvary. That price was the cross. So listen. When Jesus died for us, it doesn't give us freedom to do what we want to do with our bodies. Do you see that, friends? Christ died for us so that we come under his rulership because he owns the body. Amen? In verse 20 it says, For you are bought with a price. Therefore, so because you are bought with a price, because of what Christ has done for us, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are what? Which are God's. So we are to treat our bodies very healthy, and that shows that you're giving God what? Glory. All right? So, friends, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It gives us practical instruction as to how to take care of our bodies. How to give God glory. There's three things it mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether soever you eat, so you're eating, and your drink, or drink, you're drinking, and whatsoever you do, do what? Do all to the glory of God. So how do we show that we give God glory? By the things that we eat, by the things that we drink, and by the things that we do. If that's good, say amen. amen. Now, God gave us a diet in Genesis, right, that shows us how to eat. If you look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God put man in a garden filled with lots of fruits and, and, and delicious fruit and juicy fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and grains, right? This is the diet that gives God glory. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. This is the diet that helps us to avoid cancer, amen. to avoid high, high blood pressure, to avoid high cholesterol, to avoid heart disease. This is the diet that will help us overcome any sicknesses or diseases in our bodies. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. You know, God loves us so much. He wants us to be healthy. Amen. And Jesus, when he was on the earth, he did a lot of preaching, teaching, and what? Healing. He was healing, healing, healing. So if we love Jesus, guess what we would allow him to do to us? Heal us of all of the sicknesses and diseases that is caused by eating the wrong foods. Are you with me saying that? In, in the book of Gen Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it talks about in heaven there's going to be uh, fruits up there as well. The Bible says that every month the tree is going to bear new fruit. Can you imagine? New fruit on the same tree every single month. New fruit. I mean, we have to have one apple tree, one orange tree, one mango tree. But when you get to heaven, one tree is going to bear all kinds of different. It says all twelve uh, manner. All, it says all kinds of manner of fruit. So it's going to be different fruit on one tree. Can you imagine? So this is the diet that God gave to us that gives Him glory. Amen. Amen. Do you understand the message so far, friends? Yes. It's a message of health. It's a message of healthy living that allows Christ to abide in us. Now it says, whatsoever you eat, drink, or whatsoever you do. Does God want us to drink more water? We yeah. talked about that in our health talk today. That's how we give God glory. And also, whatsoever we do, right? Is alcohol good for the Christian? Talk to me. No. Right? Right? That, that can bring disease. Is, is tobacco good for the Christian? Talk to me. No. That can bring disease. So God is trying to get us to give him glory. People say, well, Jesus turned water into wine. Read the, read the Bible. Matthew, 20, Matthew 26 says, he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine with you until the kingdom. The fruit of the vine. That was great juice he gave them. We just got to go back and read. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. All right. So this is how we give God glory. All right. So we have a couple more. So the first one was the gospel. Right. Number two was fearing God. Number three was give him glory. Number four is the hour of what? All right. The Bible says, fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. Now, friends, I'm going to have to sum this up as much as I can because it, it could be hefty. The judgment hour is very important. That's the last message that goes to all the world. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, now, why we're saying Daniel? Because in the beginning of the message, we said that Jesus has studied two books. What are the books? Talk to me. Daniel and Revelation. In Daniel, chapter 7, we see four beasts. How many beasts? Four. We see a lion represents Babylon. We see a bear represents Middle Persia. We see a leopard represents Greece. We see a great and dreadful, ugly, monstrous beast. That beast comes from Rome. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. After those four beasts in Daniel 7, it mentions a little horn power. The little horn comes from Rome. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Another term for the little horn is the Antichrist. Anti means Anti, you are either against Christ or anti, you want to be in the place of Christ. If that's clear, say amen. amen. So the Antichrist comes from Rome. If that's clear, say amen. amen. People think the Antichrist is Obama or, or Trump. No, no, no. It comes from Rome. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Now in Daniel 7, after the little horn power, the Bible says after that event that the judgment was set and what? Talk to me. The books were open. So there's a judgment in Daniel 7. Are you with me? Say amen. So the Bible talks about a judgment, both in Daniel and in Revelation. And this judgment prepares us for the coming of the Lord. Are you with me? Say amen. Now, I want to fast forward and talk about what the judgment is. Because in Revelation chapter 20, we also see a judgment. That judgment is when the wicked are resurrected. The wicked are in their graves. They resurrect. And when they resurrect, they're going to receive a reward. Are you with me? Say amen. So the, the judgment even has the state of the dead inside of it. Do you see that, friends? 
Now, if someone dies and they're waiting for the judgment to be resurrected, that means that everyone that has died, are they in heaven? They can't be in heaven. They have to be in the grave. If that's your say amen. amen. They're waiting for the final judgment. So the judgment hour even shows us what happens when someone dies. If that's your say amen. amen. We have a life or death message. Now is the only time that we have to get right with God. Now is the only time that we have to surrender our lives to God. Now is the only time that we have to live according to godly principles. Because after we die, there's no reincarnation. You don't come back. After you die, you don't come back as a butterfly or a dog, right? After you die, that's it. We have to fake, we have to be resurrected and face God's judgment. If that's good, say amen. So this is why, number one, it's so important. We have to receive the gospel and walking in God's word so that and giving God glory so that if we die, guess what? We can be resurrected to be with Jesus forever. If that's good, say amen. All right? So in the judgment hour, we're seeing what happens when someone dies. Now listen, friends. Also, in the judgment hour, we understand what happens when someone dies. So they don't go to heaven because they have to be resurrected, right? Resurrected, resurrection is when you wake up from the grave. Are you with me saying amen? Revelation chapter 14, let's go there. Revelation 14. The Bible says in verse 13 that when someone dies, they're simply resting in their graves. That's what the Bible teaches. They're resting in their graves. So our loved ones, they're not in heaven. Think about it. If they were in heaven, they would be in pain. Looking out over the things that we're going through and can't be with us. Suffering, right? The Bible says in heaven there's no more pain. There's no more crying. There's no more sorrow. So the people that have passed are in their graves. The Bible says this in Revelation 14 verse 13. Do we have it, friends? Let's read together. The Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead, which what? They die in the Lord. Now what happens to the dead? It says, From henceforth, from now on, it says, Yea, said the Spirit, this is the Spirit of God talking, that they may what? They rest from all their labors and their works to follow them. So the Bible teaches that the dead are resting in the grave. Do you see that, friends? So do you see why the, the right understanding of the message needs to go forward so people hear the right message? Amen? Now, I want to say one more thing about the judgment before we move on. God is going to pour out His final judgments on those who receive, those who reject the three angels' messages. Are you say Amen? In Revelation chapter 17, the Bible says in verse 1, that God is going to pour out His judgments upon a place called Babylon. Now friends, we need to understand what Babylon is, so that we don't receive these judgments. In verse 1, Revelation 17, 1, you still with me friends? Yes. Are you getting weary? Are you still following me? Alright friends, almost done. And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vows, and talk with me, saying, Come hither, I will show unto thee the what? Talk to me. I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth on many waters. So John, God shows John, I'm going to show you the judgment. Are you with me so far? Say amen. The judgment of the great whore. Who's this whore? Who's this great mother? The Bible says in Revelation 17 verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written in Babylon. So we have a name for her. The great mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Right? Let me say amen. God is going to pour out judgments, the Bible says, on Babylon. If that's clear, say amen. Now Babylon, friends, is a mother, a mother that has daughters. If that's clear, say amen. In the Bible, a woman in Bible prophecy equals what? It's a church. In Ephesians 5, it says, husbands, which represents Christ, love your wife, the woman, as Christ loved the church. So the woman represents the church. So many churches that have not received the first angel's message are going to receive the judgments of Babylon in the end. The seven last plagues are going to fall upon people who claim to love God in different churches, but do not abide by the principles found in Revelation 14. Now let me just say this. There are many churches out there. I'm talking about the Lutheran church, the Baptist church, the Catholic church. Are you going to say amen? These churches, these body of believers, right, the people, God can save the people. Are you with me? Say amen. In Revelation 4, 18, verse 4, the Bible says, Revelation 18, verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. So does God have people in other churches believing the doctrines of Babylon? Yes, they're God's people. But God's going to call them out of those churches to receive the last day message. If that's going to say amen. 
So how do you know if you're in Babylon? Well, Babylon has a couple teachings that we can know that don't come from God. And by the way, Babylon, the mother of harlots, is the Roman Catholic Church. They claim to be the mother of all churches. And all the daughters that receive and practice the principles of Babylon are Babylon's daughters. So for instance, Sunday observance, right? That came from Babylon. That didn't come from the Bible. Sunday is a, the day of the Lord, or Sunday is Sabbath. That didn't come from God. That came from Babylon. All right, let me say amen. God needs to call people out of Sunday churches into his truth. Amen? Another doctrine of Babylon is that when you die, you don't die. You keep living on, right? We saw in Revelation 14 that the dead are resting in their grave. So when people say you're, the dead are in heaven, or they're in hell, or they're in purgatory, that's a doctrine that came from Babylon. God says to come out of that. Are you going to say amen? Yes. Another doctrine of Babylon is a secret rapture. That you can just, poof, disappear, and you're in heaven. The Bible doesn't teach a secret rapture. Are you going to say amen? amen? The Bible teaches that Christ is going to come and claim his people as his own. If everyone was just, poof, disappearing, going to heaven, why does Christ need to come? If that's clear, say amen. amen. Another teaching of Babylon is that you can baptize little children. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 28, Go ye therefore, teach all nations. They need to be taught first. And then what? Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? We say amen. amen. Now you can dedicate your child to God by praying, right? But baptizing a child, they need to understand what they're getting into. That's your say amen. All right? Another teaching of Babylon is that hellfire lasts forever. Are you with me? Say amen. <laughs> The Bible doesn't teach that hellfire lasts forever. As a matter of fact, let's go to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to prove that from these verses here in Revelation chapter 14. The Bible says in Revelation 14, and by the way, we're still talking about number 4, which is the judgment. God's going to pour these judgments upon Babylon, but the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, are we there, friends? Yes. Verse number 10, well, 9 talks about the mark of the beast, and don't receive it. We're going to talk about what that mark is today. And then verse 10 says, The same shall drink. These are those who receive the mark of the beast. It says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented, those who receive the mark of the beast, with what? Fire and what? Brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the Bible says that those who are going to be lost are going to be burned up. The Bible says with fire and brimstone, and the smoke ascends up. Now let me ask you guys a question. You ready for this? If something is on fire, what is the last thing to leave? The smoke. If your car is on fire, the fire goes out, so it's not burning anymore. The last thing that ascends up is the smoke. If your house is on fire, the, the fire can stop. The last thing that ascends up is what? Talk to me. The smoke. You can be cooking something. Are you with me so far? And... Your pan could be so hot with oil. And you turn off the fire, so nothing is cooking anymore. But then you go to the faucet, you turn on the water, the, the water hits the, the pan, and what ascends up? Talk to me. But is there anything cooking? The fire is already what? Turned off. Do you see that, friends? So when the Bible says the smoke ascends up forever and ever, this is talking about the results of the fire. See, if we would really see that hell's fire is going to put out the wicked, how careful would we be not to just commit sin as if it's nothing? Are you going to say amen? How careful would we be to even share the gospel because we want everyone to make it to the kingdom and that's going to say amen. Malachi chapter 4 says that, the, that the, the God will burn them up, both root and branch. So this is a message showing that hell's fire does not last forever and ever and ever. The results are forever, if that's going to say amen. Alright, friends. So, the judgment has so much in there. But for the sake of time, we're going to move on. All right? What's number five? So fear God, the gospel, fear God, give Him glory, the judgment hour. What's number five? Worship Him. Now, friends, listen. This is important. Worship Him. Worship who? Verse seven. Worship Him that what? Made what? Heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This worship is pointing back to the Creator. The creator in the book of Genesis. God made the world in how many days? Six days. And what did he do on the seventh? Rested on the seventh. So worship God who made the world in six days and, and, and rested on what day? The seventh day, the end of the week, the last day of the week. So this worship is talking about worshiping the creator, pointing to the seventh day Sabbath, which is today. Are you with me so far? So this worship is calling people to worship God on the day that He set aside, which is a Sunday Sabbath. Are you with me? Say amen. 
many Christians need to hear this message that this is the day that God has blessed, hallowed, and sanctified. And Exodus chapter 20, it says, remember the Sabbath day to do what? Keep it holy. Six days shall you labor to do all your work, but what? The seventh day is the Sabbath. What day is the Sabbath? Seven the first day? Seven. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. So where did Sunday come from? Ah, I'm glad you asked. Verse 9. All right? Verse 9. So God says worship Him. So where did Sunday come from? In verse 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship what? The beast. And what? His image. And what? Receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So let's stop there. In Daniel 7, we said this earlier, that there were four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. Are you with me so far? These four beasts, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and what's the last one? Again, we're living in the last days. The last one is what? Talk to me. Rome. Rome. Did you know the Roman Catholic Church, they changed the day from Saturday to what? To Sunday. The Roman Catholic Church, they were the ones that took this day and said, it's not the Sabbath, and made their own day and called it the Sabbath. And guess what? They were selling this idea to all the religions. As a matter of fact, the Roman Catholic Church, and if you go back and, and look at history, the, the Baptist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Pentecostal Church, all these churches said that Saturday is actually the Sabbath, but we are going to worship on Sunday. Isn't that interesting, friends? So the beast of, of Revelation 14, Daniel 7, is the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, and they have declared that they have another day. If that's going to say amen. Now the Bible says don't worship according to the beast. Did you know that the beast, the Roman, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, if you look at the papacy, what is he doing? He's constantly going from nation to nation, country to country, meeting with world leaders. Are you saying amen? You know the Bible prophesied that would happen? Let's go to Revelation 4, 17 and verse 1. Revelation 17 verse 1. They're going to the kings of the earth, those in political power. They're going from country to country. They're going from Africa. They're going to America. They're meeting with the president. They're, going all, they're meeting all these political parties. Why? Because the Bible teaches that the kings of the earth, the government, the state, is going to support and uplift the papacy and then enforce their day in America and all over the world to get people to worship the beast, which is the papacy, and to receive the beast's mark. If that's going to say amen. Revelation 17, verse 1, the Bible says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vows. That's the seven last plagues. And he talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon what? Many? Now, if you sit on a chair, that means the chair is what? It's supporting you. Water in the Bible represents people. People are supporting the system. Verse 2, it says, With whom the kings of the earth have done what? They committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the Bible is teaching that the kings of the earth are joining with Rome to bring about this mark. Now, if the beast is Rome, where does the mark have to come from? Talk to me. From Rome. If you go to Walmart and you walk out with a blue bag, you know that sign, that, that bag came from Walmart. Are you with me so far? If I go into a store and I come out with a bag that's red with white circles, where do I go? How do you know I didn't go to Safeway? How do you know I didn't go to KTA? Because the bag comes from the store. Are you with me so far? So the mark has to come from the beast. If that's going to say amen. Did you know what the mark of the beast is, friends? People think it's a microchip. They think it's a, a tattoo. They think it's, it's the, the vaccine. Oh, I don't need the vaccine. It's the mark of the beast. People are even scared of the number 666. Oh, it's a, the mark of the beast. Listen, friends. The mark of the beast is nothing but Sunday observance. The Rome said Sunday belongs to them. Sunday is our mark. And they said, we are above the Bible because we keep Sunday rather than the Sabbath. And many people are scared of signs and numbers and ghosts and goblins. But Sunday is worldwide kept. And that's the sign of the papacy. Are you going to say amen? amen? Now listen, if you have family members that love God, love the Bible, love His truth, but keep Sunday, I believe they could be saved. Are you with me? God says they're still His people. Amen? But once they now have the knowledge of God, the truth of God, the Bible says they now have to walk in accordance with God's word. If that's your say, amen. amen. So if we keep going to Sunday places, Sunday churches, we're not honoring God. We're honoring the papacy. And the papacy is anti-God, anti-Christ. If that's your say, amen. amen. 
Friends, listen, we need to understand this. And you want to know why? You, people may look at this church and say, you know what, this church is so small. Oh, friends, listen. How, how do we know we have the right message? Well, listen, remember Elijah on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings chapter 18? Elijah was by himself. The prophets of Baal were wrong. Baal means sun worship. Are you with me so far? Amen. Elijah stood by himself on the word of God. And let me tell you something. You may have to stand by yourself to stand for God. Amen. You may have to leave large congregations and people that claim they're walking with God. But if they reject God's word, they're on their way to destruction. The Bible says, broad is the way. Wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction. But the Bible says, narrow is the gate. Straight is the way. And how much... Few, few there be that find it. If I am walking with the few, praise God, I'm walking with Jesus. Are you with me so far? If you're walking with the majority, friends, oh, you need to search your heart. Maybe you're not walking as closely to Christ as you think. Are you with me? Say amen. All right, friends. God says worship him. Come back to the seventh-day Sabbath. It's still God's day. Amen? All right, we bring this to a close. I said there was only two more points, right? So we had gospel. Fear God. Give Him glory. The hour of His judgment. Worship Him, God. Are you with me so far? Point number six is God's people. Revelation fourteen twelve. We see God's people in this. God did not leave us to say this is wrong, but won't point out what's right. Amen? He shows us there's a people that's still keeping the commandments of God. In verse 14, Revelation fourteen twelve, it says, Revelation fourteen twelve. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have what? And have the faith of Jesus. God points out his remnant keeping people. There is still a church on earth keeping all ten commandments. There is still a church on earth that God puts his stamp upon and says, These are my remnant people. There is still a people on earth that is holding up God's truth. Holding up God's word. Holding up God's standards. And friends, let me tell you something. That church is a seven day Adventist church. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. The seven day Adventist church. But you want to know what? The devil's working so hard within that church to get people not to work. So that's why we call this message, our divine assignment, the three angels message, get to get to work. Get to work. We need to get to work. More people need to hear this message. More people need to understand this truth. And let me tell you something. Maybe you're saying, how can I get this message out there? Listen, we have publications. We have books. We can just share those books with people. Are you going to say amen? We can put a phone number in there. If you want Bible studies, give me a call. If you want to know, know more, give me a call. Right? We say amen. We can share this truth even in simple methods. God may, may be moving upon your heart to start some kind of health food store or something, right? Just make simple soaps in your home. And then to get advertisement, go to Walmart and say, listen, what's in this soap right here? Oh, do you know what this is? This is dangerous. And then promote your soap right here. All right, we say amen. <laughs> and then as people come... Then you say, thank you for your business. God bless you. Here's a track. And that track can have something on there that can be life-changing. Yes. Then, because you're, you're having uh, some kind of method of giving them something they need, now you can give them the gospel. Did Jesus do that, friends? Yes. Did he meet people's needs before he gave them the gospel? So listen, friends. Whatever talent God has given to you, whatever gift God has given to you, some of us can sew, some of us can bake, some of us can cook. Are you going to say amen? Some of us are good at one-on-one evangelism. Some of us can go out and do different stuff. Whatever gift God's given to you, please get involved. Get to work because God needs us to finish this work. Are you with me so far? And let me say this. I believe with all my heart God wants the people. uh, Let me rephrase this. I believe with all my heart that God can move upon the people to do more work than the pastor. Amen? Amen? We're told where the pastor can't go, the living preachers can go. Books can go, tracks can go, people that you meet on your job. You're able to influence them more than I can, if that's your say, amen. amen. So all of us need to get to work, amen? Yes. All of us need to get to work. And what happens if we all abide by these principles we sing in three of those messages? Number seven, Jesus comes. How many of us want Christ to come? Amen. Tired of pain, tired of sickness, tired of hearing of another coronavirus, Tired of hearing of a different war? Tired of hearing about killing and shooting? Tired of hearing of what happened in Maui? Are you with me so far? Tired of all these natural disasters? Tired of all... I'm tired. I want to go home. Are you with me so far? But guess what? We can't say I'm tired and sit down and do nothing. No, no, no. We have to be tired and show that we're really tired by working. If you're really tired of working and you want to go home, get to work. And when the devil tells you again, 
you're no good, you're a sinner, look at your past, you can't do this work, you're, you're a no good, you're, you're a scum. When the devil tells you all this stuff, remember point number one, the everlasting. And I believe that's why we're not moving. We have forgotten what God has done for us. We have forgotten what Jesus means to us. We have forgotten the love he bestows upon us. If we, I believe, if we embrace the gospel, the rest of the steps from two to seven will be like an escalator. Once you step on, you're just going up. Are you with me so far? So I want to encourage you, embrace the gospel. Embrace Jesus. Embrace spending time with him. Embrace your Bible study time. Embrace your devotional time. Because Jesus will help you to live for him. He will help you to bring your life according to him. He will help you to, to, to understand the truth. He will help you give the truth to others. Are you with me so far? Say amen. Your time with Jesus is so important. It's more powerful than hearing a sermon. It's more powerful than going to church. I'm not saying don't come to church. Come to church. But your time with Jesus is so important that you can understand the gospel and then share it with others. Amen? amen. Were you blessed by this, Mrs. Friends? Yes. Did you understand the seven points? Yes. Say it with me. Number one, everlasting gospel. Number two, fear God. Number three, give him glory. Number four, judgment hour. Number five, worship him. Number six, God's people. Number seven, now you can explain the three angels' message in only seven points. Seven points. You can give a Bible study something. It's seven points. All right, friends, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for the gospel. We're so thankful for Jesus. None of us should be here today. None of us should even have the opportunity to work for you. Oh, Lord, we look at our lives and we look at ourselves and we say, Lord, I don't know how you can use me. I don't know how you can use us. But we're so thankful for the everlasting gospel for Jesus, for his shed blood, for his righteousness, for his grace, that you would love a sinner like us, a sinner like me. Oh, Father, please wrap us in your righteousness. Clothe us with your presence. When the devil tells us of our condition, may we remember the first angel's message. And may you teach us how to fear you, how to give you glory, how to rightly understand the judgment hour and then share it with others, how to worship you. Lord, please, we want to be a part of your remnant people doing this work so that we and others can be prepared for your second coming. As your head is bowed, your eyes is closed, I'm impressed to ask you, if you have been in touched by the Holy Spirit, if you understand what God said to you, you're saying, Lord, help me, I accept this message, help me to live it, just raise your hand where you are. Praise God, I see hands going up. I accept this message, help me to live it. Let's pray. Father in heaven. I pray for the hands that have been raised. Help us to live these messages and give them to the world. Teach us, dear Father. Guide us step by step. And may we also remember that we are called to give this message to the world. Help us, dear Father, that we will not sit down and idle as the disciples when they said, Why send you gazing? Oh, we don't want to just stand doing nothing, sit doing nothing. Help us every day to do something to further the work of God. Show us what our talents are. Show us what you have called us to do. And help us, dear Father, to get this message out there before it's too late. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.